Luke's account stretching from the gospel to Acts is more than just a historical record. It's a vivid narrative of how God's kingdom breaks into our world from end to end, starting with Jesus and continuing through the Spirit-empowered followers as his witness then and now. In the mid-17th century, Mary Fisher, a Quaker woman, embarked on an extraordinary journey fueled by deep faith, courage, and conviction. Imagine this, in an era fraught with danger where people were traveling, especially women, she went alone across continents. Mary's journey was nothing short of remarkable. She traveled over 600 miles on foot, But it's the purpose behind her journey that captures our heart. Her destination, the court of the Sultan of Turkey. Her mission, to share Jesus' salvation and his message, his love, his peace, and his way of living as a new human. Mary's message came under the banner of Christ's love. She didn't carry a sword or seek to impose her beliefs by force. Instead, she walked as a solitary figure, relying on the strength God provided and the conviction of her faith. Upon reaching Sultan Mehmed IV, the Ottoman emperor, Mary's encounter was unprecedented. Can you imagine this? A Caucasian woman in the heart of the Islamic empire sharing God's gospel message. But she did. God provided someone who was ready to take her concerns to the Grand Vizier, a high-ranking political official close to and the advisor of the Sultan. The Sultan was notified that this English woman had come bearing a message from the great God for him. And he granted her this opportunity to have a conversation with an interpreter. What she said wasn't recorded, but I imagine it was much like what Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 3. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follows them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. The sultan listened to her message, which was a remarkable occurrence that speaks volumes to Mary's faith and the grace with which she conveyed her message. After she finished, she asked him if he understood, and he said, yes, every word, and it's true. What a powerful reminder that the gospel of Jesus knows no boundaries, and our call to God's word and sharing it transcends cultural, geographical, and religious divides. 
Mary Fisher's journey is a, a beacon of inspiration. It challenges us to consider how far we are willing to go and share the love of Jesus. In the modern, our modern context, we might not trek across continents, but we are called to step out of our comfort zones, to engage those who think differently than we, and to share the gospel's transformative power and, with gentleness and respect. As followers of Jesus, we're reminded by Mary's story that our faith is not passive. It's a living, breathing call to action. Mary Fisher's legacy teaches us about courage rooted in faith. And this is what bridges, divides, and opens hearts as long as we are willing to pray, go, speak, and trust God's Spirit to lead. Pray with me. Father God, we want to trust your spirit to lead us today. Speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Open our minds. Help us to understand your word. And not just be hearers, but doers. In Jesus' name, amen. When Jesus walked this earth, he didn't just leave his, us or his apostles, uh, disciples that he had high and dry. He ascended to heaven but he also empowered them with the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit. It's like he handed the baton and said, okay, now it's your turn to go take my kingdom message and share it with others to every corner of the globe. The presence of God filled them, giving them this incredible strength and confidence, even when they were staring down some pretty scary stuff like persecution, death threats, and you name it. But they did it for the sake of spreading the message of Jesus as the risen Messiah. They put their life on the line for that, for him. And these guys started something huge, the church. When we dive into the book of Acts, which is like the sequel of the Gospel of Luke, it's opening a diary of Jesus' earliest followers, launching his church as they formed communities of followers wherever they went. Filled with God's spirit, they set on this epic adventure to take the good news of God's kingdom to the ends of the earth. The Big Seed Church kickoff became a vibrant, diverse community, bringing people together under the banner of Jesus' love and salvation. That's who the church is supposed to be today as well as we collectively change the world. In the concluding section of Acts, we see Paul, one of the most influential followers of Jesus who had the greatest number of communities started for following Jesus because he shared the true testimony of how Jesus gave him a real-life experience, changing him from the inside out. He completely turned around. And we see him in Acts chapter 28 enter the final leg of his journey from Jerusalem to Rome. When he got there, he was landed in jail, right in the epicenter of the Roman Empire, where he had the opportunity, based on God's sovereign plan, to share his kingdom message to the many nations intersecting there, and in the heart of the one nation who was keeping the Jewish people hostage. The message Paul so boldly proclaimed wherever he went was Christ's sacrifice, of shedding his blood on the cross and the Holy Spirit-powered resurrection from the dead. Jesus created, because of that, Jesus created the one unified family of equals living in his kingdom rule as the ultimate king of the world. God's message was that the whole story of Israel being the chosen conduit for God's plan of salvation and redemption culminated by fulfilling his promises and prophecies in the person of Jesus as Messiah, the anointed one who came to restore everyone to have the right and intimate relationship with him, starting in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So now, let's finish our journey through Acts with its final chapter. Open your Bible or your Bible app to Acts chapter 28. The words will not be on the screen the whole day today. 
So please follow along in your own Bible so you are familiar in how to use it when you're home. If you don't use it in church, you're less likely to use it at home. So we want to be familiar to use it together. We have brand new CSB study uh, CSB Bibles in the back cabinet where the offering co- container is, so you can help yourself there. You can also cheat off of a neighbor. It's okay to cheat when looking at the Bible there. <laughs> so you can look at your neighbor. If you don't know where Acts is, ha- ask your neighbor to help you find Acts. We're going to look at Acts chapter 28, the very final chapter. We're going to start with the first six verses. Everybody there? Anyone need more time? No? Good. All right. Verses 1 through 6. Once safely ashore, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The local people showed us extraordinary kindness. They lit a fire and took us all in since it was raining and cold. As Paul gathered a bundle of brushwood and put it on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the local people saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to one another, This man, no doubt, is a murderer. Even though he has escaped the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But he shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no harm. They expected that he would begin to swell up and suddenly drop dead. After they waited a long time and saw nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. (laughs) So on his journey to Rome, Paul was shipwrecked right off the island of Malta, which is just south of Sicily. When building a fire, a disgusting, evil, vile, slithering, slimy spawn of Satan himself, snake jumped on him and latched onto Paul's hand, but no harm came of him because God was in control. Paul just shook it off and sent it back in the fire where it belonged. (laughs) No, Satan, you're not winning this battle. You're not going to take Paul out. No foul serpent was going to best God's man on his mission. So from the perspective of the people there in Malta, They looked at him and they thought, well, he's going to die for sure because this snake bit him, and rightly so. He was a murderer, justice served. Well, they didn't know Paul. They waited and watched. Nothing happened. Then they decided that, well, Paul is going to be a god because he just shook off Satan's literary agent of death. But as soon as Paul did that, he said, nope. God is the one and only. Because of this experience, Paul was able to use it to glorify God and minister to the people on Malta. And that was a big W for God's kingdom. Verses 7 through 10. Now in the area around that place was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Publius's father was in bed, suffering from a fever and dysentery. Paul went to him and prayed, and laying hands on him, he healed him. After this, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So they heaped many honors on us, and when we sailed, they gave us what we needed. So Paul went to see Malta's leading man named Publius because his father was ill with dysentery. I remember several years back, I was on a missions trip to Brazil on that ship. And we went on the Amazon River. We went village to village, like way out. It took us two days to get to the first village we were going to go see. And when we were there, we always, every single time we landed in a village, we went to like 12 or so villages. Every time we landed in a new village, we went to the leading person. It it was always some old guy sitting in a home by himself and cooking something, (laughs) which was so good. But we went there to make sure that he gave his approval that we can go talk to his people. And we only had one person turn us down. But then uh, his wife said, no, no, you you can go. (laughs) So Paul did the same thing. Paul laid hands on Publius' dad, and this guy was healed because of the actionable faith of Paul. God was glorified, and because of this miracle, many more people also came to see Paul and were healed. These signs were to bring people to faith in Jesus. 
Because of that, they were so grateful and generous, and they provided aid to Paul, to Luke, to their traveling companions. They welcomed them into their fold like, the fam- like a family. God just continued to do his thing because of their faithfulness. Verses 11 through 13. After three months, we sailed, we set sail in an Alexandrian ship that had wi- wintered on the island with the twin gods as its figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we, sail, we stayed three days. From there, after making a circuit along the coast, we reached Regium. After, after one day, a south wind sprang up, and the second day, we came to Putali. Let's stop there. So they stayed in Malta for three months because it was winter, and the winter was really rough. And then they procured an Alexandrian ship of significance and prestige because it had the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux, who were also sons of Zeus. Now they were riding in style. <laughs> Verses 14 and 15. They were found, there we found brothers and sisters and were invited to stay a week with them. And so we came to Rome. Now the brothers and sisters from there had heard about the news about us and had come to meet us as far as the Forum of Epius and the Three Taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. So along the way, they stopped at a few places, and fellow brothers and sisters in the faith who heard about Paul and Luke's missionary journey, they encouraged them. Paul encouraged them back, and they showed hospitality to them. And hospitality is a marker. It's an attribute of Jesus' followers. Verse 16, when we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So Paul was permitted to live on his own, guarded only by one soldier. At this point, they trusted Paul. They didn't think he was a flight risk, or really they didn't care if he went or came or whatever he was doing at the time. Verses 17 through 22, after three days, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had gathered with them, Brothers, he said, brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. After he examined me, they wanted to release me, since there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. Because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no charge to bring against my people. For this reason, I've asked to see you and speak to you. In fact, it is for the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. Then they said to him, we haven't received any letters about you from Judea. None of the brothers has come and reported or spoken anything evil about you. But we want to hear what your views are, since we know that people everywhere are speaking against this sect. So after all that, Paul finally landed in Rome. And instead of going to them, Jews came to see him. He had them as his audience to share the good news of Jesus directly, and he got there on Rome's dime because God provided the way. Paul briefly briefed all of them about why he was there and what was going on but they hadn't received any information about them from those Jews in Judea who were trying to get rid of him. I think that those Jerusalem Jews just wanted him out of sight, out of mind, get him out of our region so that we can get back to living our old way. But Paul was given the opportunity with these new Jews and permission to share with the Roman Jews about his views, about what they heard about the sect, because they were curious. Now, if you remember, the mentioning of the sect was during Paul's trial when he was before Roman governor Felix. He said this, but I admit this to you. I worship the God. This is in Acts chapter 24, by the way. And we do have a slide. Or we should. Do we have a slide? There we go. But I admit this to you. I worship the God of my ancestors according to the way, capital W, W, that means Jesus, which they call the sect believing everything that is in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. Verses 23 through 28. After arranging a day with him, many came to him at his lodging. 
from dawn to dusk. He expounded and testified about the kingdom of God. He tried to persuade them about Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. Some of them were persuaded by what he said, but others did not believe. Disagreeing among themselves, they began to leave after Paul made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah when he said, go to these people and say, you will always be listening, but never understanding, and you will always be looking, but never perceiving. For the hearts of these people have grown callous, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. So Paul shared the gospel with them. However, not all believed. It was common, even for Paul. This confirmed the prophecy of the Jews, about the Jews given by Isaiah, which was the Old Testament prophecy, the longest um, prophet book in the Old Testament. And Paul quoted in verses 26 and 27 of chapter 28 here, he quoted out of the book of Isaiah. And Paul used the new covenant association with God. Now remember, the new covenant was because of Jesus, because he shed his blood on the cross, because of the regenerative work that the Holy Spirit is doing in those who believe, in their hearts. That is the new covenant, to communicate. He communicated this to the Roman Jews. That God was was working way back then in Isaiah's day. That in the same way now, as their hard-hearted and stiff-necked ancestors were, these people would not listen and would not see it either. What we're seeing is that Paul dealt with the same thing, the same sort of people that Isaiah did. All right, last two chapters of the book of Acts. I'm sorry, last two verses of the book of Acts. Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and the teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul remained in his own house. They gave him, he's a prisoner, and they gave him a house that he paid for probably out of his own tent-making trade funds and those who were supporting his ministry. God brought him to Rome, one of the major capitals of the entire ancient ends of the earth, to boldly proclaim the kingdom of God and teach everyone about Jesus without any interference. He no longer had to go to people because God brought those people to him. On his journey, Paul narrowly escaped death to Rome when he was going to Rome. But when he finally reached the city, the slate was cleared and the way was paved wide on the Roman roads. He was put on house arrest in a nice home where he regularly met with people and shared the good news about Jesus. This was all part of God's master plan to spread his message of how his kingdom came here to earth through Jesus. And God continues to spread the same message by his spirit in his people, the church. Paul proved his faithfulness to King Jesus. What it means to prove our faithfulness to King Jesus today is to share the good news in word and action, living the Jesus way. Form diverse communities where people, all people are equal. And trust and respond to the guidance of God's Holy Spirit to lead the way forward. Paul's journey wasn't just about hopping from city to city to share some good news. His final stretch, as captured in the the last handful of chapters in Acts, really highlights the roller coaster of his mission. He convened in Jerusalem, a place buzzing with rumors of hatred for him, but he went there anyway. Some Jews misunderstood his message, thought he turned his back on Israel. This led to a big mix-up, and the next thing you know, Romans have mistook him for a rebel from Egypt, and they arrested him. 
Paul found himself in the hot seat facing trial after trial, going from Jewish Sanhedrin to Roman governors and even King Herod Agrippa. Despite being tossed around, no one was able to put a crime on him. I mean, all he was doing was talking about the hope of the resurrection in Jesus, which was hardly a crime, right? But stuck in the gears of the Roman legal system, Paul ended up appealing to the highest court. Now you think being locked up would slow Paul down. But God and his spirit turned what looked like a setback into a strategic play. While in prison, waiting to meet Caesar, Paul penned the Paramount New Testament books as letters, Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, that not only deepened the faith of the early followers of Jesus, but also ensured that this mission that Paul was on and this message would live through the ages. Under house arrest, Paul didn't miss a beat. He hosted meetings and meals with people, reaching out to both Jews and Gentiles alike to model for them Jesus' new way of living and his redemptive salvation. Acts concludes with Paul, undeterred, it says, announcing the kingdom of God and boldly teaching all about the Lord Jesus Messiah, totally unhindered, right in the heart of the empire. Luke's account stretching from the gospel to Acts is more than just a historical record. It's a vivid narrative of how God's kingdom breaks into our world from end to end, starting with Jesus and continuing through the Spirit-empowered followers as his witness then and now. John Collins, Tim Mackey, and the Bible Project team write this. The good news of the risen King Jesus leads to the formation of communities where individuals from various backgrounds are treated with equality as they pledge their allegiance to Jesus and live according to his teachings. Throughout the four Gospels, we see that Jesus is indeed the Messianic King, but he will reign over Israel by suffering. His actions usher in an upside-down kingdom marked by self-giving love, and he challenges his disciples to follow his example and share in his ministry. Luke shows us what it means to live out our faith in Jesus, blending word and action beyond the pages of Acts into our lives today. We began talking about Mary Fisher's 600-mile trek to share the gospel message with the Sultan of Turkey. But there's another Mary in Quaker history that I, I want to share with you. It's a remarkable story that literally changed the religious climate of our country. Mary Dyer. Set in the 17th century in Boston, Massachusetts, Mary Dyer, despite being banished by death threats for her refusal to renounce her faith, displayed resilience. She returned to the Boston colony not once, but multiple times with an unwavering commitment to stand for religious liberty and her solidarity with those who were persecuted for their beliefs. The climax of Mary's journey came in 1660 when she was executed on the Boston Common as a martyr for the cause of religious freedom. Her execution was a turning point, igniting a political conversation about tolerance and the right to worship freely, eventually contributing to the broader movement for religious liberty right here in the United States. Both Marys, Fisher and Dyer share a powerful story that reminds us of the bold lengths individuals have gone to share the message of Jesus across the earth throughout time. The conviction to their rule of life underscores the magnitude and the power of God in our stories and the impact of living our faith with courage and conviction and confidence. The journey of both Marys serve as an inspiration for us to share the gospel, demonstrating that obstacles and distances are surmountable with confidence in God's Spirit leading the way. 
The book of Acts ends the story of the early church. However, the story is not over. Because its message is what we're still talking about today, right now. And what we're still taking with us to the ends of the earth. God spoke through the prophets Isaiah and Habakkuk saying, Look, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? For I am doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. The good news of Jesus is spreading because as we continue the mission of God's kingdom expanding to the world, it continues to spread. That's the Jesus way. This is how we live in God's kingdom. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is who we are called to be as the church, our identity in Christ, and our rule of life as disciples and disciple-makers of Jesus. Pray with me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I thank you for your redemptive message of salvation because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of the most significant miracle ever of the powerful resurrection. We can have new life in Christ. Don't let the significance, the importance of that fade away from our minds and our hearts. Help us to be people who who take your message and, and bring it to the ends of the earth. Whatever that looks like in the context of our ends of the earth here in our life. Maybe that means going across the ocean. Maybe that means going across our town. Give us the same courage and conviction and confidence in your word, your truth, because of your spirit, because of the life that your word reveals to us when we read it, when we absorb it. And Father, I ask that by your spirit you Show us the way that you want us to go and live and think and identify as your disciples, making more. In Jesus' name, amen.